Chun, the Dean of Yale College in Boston. He leads a cognitive neuroscience laboratory which uses brain imaging and machine learning to study how people see, pay attention, remember, and perform optimally. He's also the first Dean of Asian descent in Yale's 319-year history. I'm really honored uh, and grateful uh, to the Che Foundation and to the University of Tokyo for having me. Uh, I'm very excited for the sessions, uh, and I'm happy to share my work. Uh, we can begin my slides, please. Yeah. Um, so if you watch, uh, I'll be talking about mind reading uh, with brain imaging and with uh, the use of artificial intelligence. Uh, if you watch any science fiction movie, uh, you will have, you know, you have craft that can fly at, uh, at light speeds, uh, you have laser cannons, you and you see? usually have a scene where someone is trying to read someone's mind using a brain scanner. Um, we, we can't fly at uh, light speed. Uh, we don't have laser cannons yet. Uh, but what I'm going to share with you today is that we do have the ability to start reading people's minds uh, using brain scanners. And, and the practical um, use of this is, is, uh, is profound. You know, when you go to a hospital, uh, to get a checkup, uh, uh, you know, and, and you have a fever, you know, the doctor doesn't say, oh, is your fever high or medium? Uh, they, they put a thermometer in you and they precisely measure your temperature. Or in the next slide, uh, you know, if you have it to test for your blood pressure, uh, they quantify, they, they very precisely measure your blood pressure uh, using devices. Uh, however, uh, for, menti, for many mental conditions, especially mental illnesses uh, and cognitive uh, performance, uh, as shown in the next slide, um, we don't have ways to precisely uh, measure uh, mathematically and with numbers uh, uh, someone's cognitive state. Uh, their memory, uh, their dementia status uh, cannot be measured very precisely. Or in the next slide, uh, in the case of autism, we don't have good ways of predicting the development of autism, especially in young children, or ways of measuring it, its severity uh, or its type. Uh, in the next slide, uh, depression is a major affliction, uh, for, especially for modern society. Uh, and yet, uh, despite its debilitating effects and the importance of treatment of depression, we do not have good ways to measure the severity of depression and uh, ways to predict what kinds of treatment would work better for individual patients. And finally, in the next slide, uh, and we heard this uh, in the opening remarks, uh, that modern society brings out a lot of anxiety and technology brings out a lot of anxiety, including social media. Uh, and yet we do not have precise ways of measuring anxiety uh, and fear. Uh, in, in patients. Uh, there are drugs to treat anxiety, uh, but it's very hard to measure it precisely. Uh, and this is where I think uh, the power of mind reading will come in is to, uh, is to develop precise measures uh, for these many different kinds of mental illnesses uh, and disabilities. Um, as you can see here, mental illness will cost the world uh, $16 trillion uh, in, in 10 years from now according to some estimates. Uh, and in the next slide, you can see that um, according to some estimates, mental disorders uh, will, um, will be associated with the highest level of spending, the highest cost, even compared to other major medical conditions like heart disease or cancer uh, or just uh, blunt trauma. Next slide. Um, and, and just you know, on a broader note, you know, imagine you have this ability, as you see here from the Harry Potter movie, uh, to just basically put someone in a brain scanner or a hat over their head and measure everything you want to know about that person, their intellect, their personality, their resilience, 
their uh, working style, uh, their uh, you know, um, potential to succeed in a particular job uh, domain, you know, having this ability to quantify and mathematically measure a person's ability, what makes them strong and unique and, uh, and, and, and thriving uh, are things that I think can be very positive outcomes of developing uh, mind reading technologies. Uh, next slide. Uh, and, and the idea is that it's kind of like when you go to, again, going back to the medical example, you know, when you get a blood test, you can test for all different kinds of conditions and diseases uh, from a simple blood sample. Uh, and the idea is that put someone in a brain scanner like the one behind me in my background, and you would be able to measure all different kinds of things about the person um, from that brain scan. Next slide, please. Um, this will take a very broad, integrative scientific approach that goes from studying molecules all the way up to the human mind and behavior. Um, and the brain scanning technologies I'll talk about today focus more on how can we understand the human mind uh, using scientific technologies. Next slide. Uh, again, as, as a reminder, our brain uh, is this very rich, uh, you know, one of the most complex and powerful physical devices in the world that enables thought um, and emotion and all the remarkable capabilities that uh, we humans are capable of, of doing. Uh, you know, and, uh, and the question is, how do we study this physical activity uh, in, in our brains and link it to uh, the mind and behavior, uh, again, and thought and emotion? And, and basically, how do we understand our humanity uh, using these technologies. Next slide, please. Um, the tool that I'll talk about today, there, there are other tools in the, in the field, but I think the most useful tool uh, um, right now is, uh, uh, is magnetic resonance imaging or MRI. Um, uh, as you may know, um, uh, this is the same kind of device you have in all hospitals, which allows you to image um, uh, different parts of the body. Um, uh, and you can measure it and take pictures of any part of your body uh, in a very safe uh, way that doesn't require cutting you open or anything like that. Um, and so next, if we click on the next slide, it'll start a video, thank you. Um, and so this is just an example of how MRI takes pictures of slices through the body. Um, uh, it looks like the video is not showing. Uh, maybe click it one more time. Okay, it looks like the video is not showing, which, which is unfortunate, uh, but um, uh, that, that's fine. Here's, a, here's an example of uh, an MRI picture. And, um, uh, and you can see that you can really see the details of the brain. Uh, and if we go to the next slide, um, the way to think about this brain image is kind of like having a map of a city. You know where the streets are, you know where the buildings are, you know where the parks are. Uh, next slide. Um, uh, the work today will focus on functional magnetic resonance imaging, which allows us to look at brain activity. Um, and next slide. You can see here that you can see what parts of the brain are active when people are looking at different things or thinking different thoughts. Uh, next slide. And so the way to think about this is it's kind of like seeing traffic on the map. Uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, allows us to see brain activity and allows you to see where it's happening on this map or where in the brain it's happening. Next slide, please. Uh, and I wanted to just acknowledge and honor uh, the fact that uh, Dr. Seiji Ogawa, who, I, who has received his um, uh, education from the University of Tokyo, uh, if we go back, I'm, sorry, can we go back? Um, uh, and you know, is, was a major contributor to the physical and technological principles behind functional magnetic, magnetic resonance imaging and uh, has very influential scientists and has been honored by the Japan Prize uh, uh, many years ago. Next slide, please. Um, so you can do many things with this brain imaging technique. I'll first talk about mapping. Next slide. Um, you can determine, and this is what happened in the first few years of fMRI, which is only about 30 years old. In the first 10 years of fMRI research, uh, people spent a lot of time, including my own lab. Uh, this was my PhD training um, where we studied where information is processed. Uh, if you look, 
if you put people in the scanner and compare what happens in the brain when they're looking at scenes versus when they're looking at faces, then uh, next slide. You can see that different parts of the brain become more active. The place area is more active. The red area is more active when they're looking at scenes. And the blue area, the face area is more active when you're looking at faces. Next slide, please. Um, you can use these techniques to actually, uh, actually also determine what people are thinking. Uh, this is a sample of the scanner we have at Yale. And we put the president of Yale University inside the scanner because this was an opening dedication ceremony. And we told the president to focus and think about faces um, in the scanner. Um, and if he, if he was able to focus well, it would move a virtual cursor, uh, a virtual uh, uh, ribbon cutting ceremony, a scissors that would cut the ribbon to open up the imaging center, as I'll show in the next slide. Um, uh, so again, uh, next slide. Okay, yeah, so you have these scissors. Uh, this is President Salovey's brain on the left. Um, and, um, uh, sorry, on the right, yeah, and, and you can see the scissors. And sorry, next slide. I'm not sure if the video will work. Maybe it will, it doesn't work. Sorry, go back. Uh, but anyway, we basically when in the scanner using his thought alone, the president was able to move the scissors to cut that virtual red ribbon uh, to open up our brain imaging center at Yale. Next slide, please. Um, the other very powerful capability of brain imaging um, is to decode the content of brain activity. Next slide. Uh, and for this, uh, we really relied, we and many people in the field relied on uh, developments and power of machine learning, AI, um, to decode brain activity. Next slide. Um, next slide. Put up the image, great. Uh, and so using these technologies, a group uh, at UC Berkeley, uh, Jack Allen, was able to decode videos. So you showed people what's on the left. Um, and, um, and then the, the brains, and then just based on the brain's responses to the video on the left, uh, it would decode, it would guess what people were looking at on the right. Uh, next slide. And next slide, thank you. Um, this technology, that, that study I just showed was published in 20, 10 years ago. Uh, several years later, a very uh, exciting and innovative group in Japan um, uh, at ATR, um, uh, led by uh, Yuki Kamitani, um, a good friend and colleague, uh, did this beautiful study where he used brain scanners to decode dreams. Um, and this was published in the most prominent journal in science and had international attention. Uh, and so I wanted to just emphasize that uh, Japanese scientists are leading uh, this effort to use brain imaging uh, to understand and decode the mind. Uh, next slide, please. Um, from my own lab, uh, about seven years ago, 2014, uh, with my, my research group um, led by Alan Cohen and Bruce Cool, Bryce Cool did this really cool study where, next slide, uh, we showed people these faces and then measured the brain response to these faces, decoded the activity. And in the next slide, you can see on the right uh, that we can guess what faces people were looking at. Next slide. Um, so these are the faces people were looking at in the scanner. And next, click, please. Next slide. Uh, then you can, we can guess what faces people were looking at just based on the brain scanner activity uh, measured by the brain scanner. Uh, and then we can just go through the next slides very quickly. Next slide. Uh, this got, next slide, just got lots of media attention. Next slide, thank you. So you can see there's a lot of general public interest in these uh, face decoding capabilities. Next slide. Um, uh, this technology continues to get better. As you can see, the things, the left column is uh, the faces people are looking at in the scanner. On the right column is the technology that we introduced in 2014. And in the middle column is a refinement of, uh, that basically makes the reconstructions, the guesses even more precise, uh, more accurate. Um, and this was published by a, a group in Europe. Um, and, and so you can see that the technologies continue to improve, especially if you start using uh, neural networks, um, basically brain-like AI networks uh, allow you to improve this ability to read the mind. Next slide. 
In fact, even Kamitani's group is also using uh, neural networks to uh, decode the mind at higher resolution. Next slide. Um, so this is just an example of the deep neural network. Uh, this is the same kind of structure architecture that allows AI to do all the remarkable things that it's doing, especially autonomous driving uh, or pattern matching um, uh, in Google image searches. Next slide. Uh, and so you can see that, you know, you can even decode letters, which, which are pretty, uh, which I think is a pretty remarkable achievement as, as shown over here, uh, especially in the word neuron. On the bottom is the, uh, is the brain imaging measurements um, decoded with neural networks and then generated these guesses on the bottom, which look really remarkable. I think some of the best examples of mind reading right now. Next slide. Uh, and again, these technologies are not just for lab uh, work, but these are what underlie uh, your ability to classify and find images based on words. Next slide. Uh, my own group, uh, we're using these technologies to understand individual differences. Um, we, had, we published two papers, next slide, uh, and next slide. Uh, these two papers uh, allowed us to do the following, next slide. We can put, uh, basically we can do what was in the Harry Potter movie. We can put people in brain scanners and we could, we could measure their IQ. Uh, we can measure their personality and we can measure how attentive they are as shown in the next slide. Um, so this was uh, published, uh, we can measure how smart you are. We can measure whether you're attentive or not. And other people are using these technologies to measure depression, anxiety, um, memory deficits, and, uh, Alzheimer's disease and so on. Next slide. Uh, so you can see that we go, you know, within the past 30 years, we've rapidly developed from brain mapping to decoding to actually predicting people's behavior, be able to measure what, how capable they are in intelligence and other kinds of behavioral measures. Uh, next slide. Uh, and this is all very heavily reliant on uh, developments in artificial intelligence. Uh, uh, as shown over here, there, I think human intelligence and artificial intelligence have different strengths, and the goal is for them to be married so that we have, so that we can improve society by the marriage of human intelligence and, and artificial intelligence on the left. Sorry, next slide. Um, um, uh, what we have, sorry, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, you know, we have these remarkable capabilities uh, using uh, uh, AI to uh, play poker against and to beat humans in poker. Next slide. Uh, you all may know about the famous computer uh, algorithm that uh, beat uh, the best Go, Go masters in the world. Uh, next slide. This was all really made possible by um, this wonderful group. Uh, I think one of the best AI companies in the world, Google DeepMind, led by Demis Hassabis. Um, and I, I just wanted to note that Demis Hassabis, his PhD training was in neuroscience. Uh, this is one of the big points I wanna make in my uh, talk today is that a lot of these innovations uh, were made because we have a better understanding of how the mind and how the brain works. Uh, next slide. And so this is a quote from, uh, from Demis Hassabis. He published articles saying his AI is inspired by neuroscience. And next slide. And he talks about how you really need these two fields to come together uh, in order to make uh, AI more useful for us uh, and also to allow us to maintain control over AI so that it's beneficial for society. Next slide. Um, so if we, next slide. Uh, we look at the different strengths of the, uh, one, one more slide please, thank you. Um, the different strengths of human intelligence and artificial intelligence. Human intelligence is, is still more versatile. It's faster a learner and you have ethical control. Um, AI has speed, it has power. It can learn uh, on its own uh, more quickly. Uh, in some ways, um, it can learn more information with its power, uh, and it also makes better use of big data um, and requires big data to work. Uh, and the goal is to really marry these two uh, so that we have the best possible combination that will uh, be good for all of us. Uh, next slide. Uh, so in closing, uh, again, uh, we have, um, uh, brain imaging that's personalized, that's precise, and that's predictive of behavior that will have many clinical uses. And in the next slide, 
Uh, we, we have to be very careful, though, about protecting mental privacy, uh, about thinking of ways to use this appropriately in legal settings. Uh, and finally, we have to worry about prejudice and bias when you're using AI and brain scanning technologies uh, to uh, read out people's characteristics. Uh, but hopefully I've given you a flavor of all the exciting uh, um, opportunities that we have ahead of us. And I thank you so much for your attention. All right, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Chan. I, I learned that the, the importance or great potential of these uh, uh, two technologies converging into uh, one, uh, that is uh, brain science and the, or brain or mind recording technology and the uh, AI. And I, I like to uh, ask, uh, or I like to ask you uh, about the, uh, or I like to ask you to to tell us uh, some more uh, ideas about how we could use this technology uh, to, uh, for example, uh, to contribute to the realization of an inclusive society in a sense that, for example, minimizing. Uh, people's disability by using this kind of technology or smooth out the communication or those kinds. Can you tell us about those kind of things? Uh, yes, thank you. I, I think a very important um, application of brain imaging and AI uh, development is to, um, uh, is to make the world more inclusive. Um, I, I think right now, for example, college admission or admission to very competitive work environments. Um, um, I, I think um, relies on testing. It relies on uh, various methods that may advantage um, uh, uh, privileged uh, uh, groups in society. Uh, and, and one hope is to use these technologies to even the playing field uh, and to give opportunities for people who have not had uh, societal benefits. Um, uh, and of course, it will help with uh, individuals with disabilities. I think that's the whole point. Uh, there's stigma to, uh, associated still with mental illness, but if you can mm -hmm. quantify it as a medical condition, uh, you know, just like measuring your blood pressure, it should be like measuring your blood pressure. Uh, we don't have bias against people with high blood pressure. And likewise, we shouldn't have bias against people who have uh, depressive symptoms or anxiety. We should uh, treat these with, uh, in an, an objective way and with compassion and empathy. Um, and, uh, and I think all of these technologies can, I, uh, can help um, uh, make everyone feel more inclus included and, and, and treated fairly. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Great. And uh, thank you so much for the fascinating talk. Thank yes, thank you very thank much, you Professor Chun. And uh, apologies again for the sound trouble we had at the beginning of your speech. Very interesting. And I guess it was amazing that all of us got to see uh, the brain of the president of Yale. <laughs> thank you very much. Great honor to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.